Um, as we've said in, in this uh, series, uh, Paul is writing his young protege, Timothy, instructing him as a young, as a young pastor, instructing him in how, how the church is to conduct themselves and what a healthy church or a godly church is to, to reflect in the order of how they conduct their services and, and how they live their lives. Because the gospel, the witness of the gospel is at stake. And so uh, we're going to be looking at 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And I've titled this message, A Vision for a Healthy Church. Let us pray together. Father, as we open up the pages of Scripture, give us eyes to see what you want us to see, and help us to respond to your revelation in your word. Your word carries the authority, and we ask that um, you would help us to submit to it, help us to yield to it, renew our minds in the ways that we have been shaped or influenced by uh, this culture. God, would you renew our minds with biblical truth? Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And lead us into a prayerful life. Lead us into a godly life, a peaceful life that would honor you and do good to those around. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we've titled this, A Vision for a Healthy Church. 1 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 1. The Apostle Paul has already uh, described his apostolic authority, and he's already uh, given uh, Timothy a charge to protect the church, to preserve the gospel, to guard the gospel against false teachers that had crept into the church. Timothy was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And in this exhortation here, verse 1, he says, First of all, then, I urge that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. For this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of of our God, of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all which is the testimony at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and I am telling you the truth. I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. So here's our big idea this morning. This is God's word. And this is our big idea. God calls his people to a godly life of prayerfulness and mission with the view of his global redemptive plan. God calls his people to a godly life of prayerfulness and mission with a view to his global redemptive plan. Paul starts off this section saying, first of all, I urge you, I urge that supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people. So as the Apostle Paul is instructing Pastor Timothy and how the church is to, to, what is to mark the church and how how are they to conduct themselves, especially when they gather together, the church is called to be a prayerful church. I mean, what, what is the Christian life without prayer? I mean, we are those who believe our Lord Jesus who said in John 15 that apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be given to you. So we are a people who are dependent upon God. We are a people who express our dependence upon God in our prayers 
And our prayers, as we see in this passage, our prayers are not to be limited to only us individually or us even corporately as a church, but are to go beyond and tap into God's global plans and purposes for this world. As Jesus said to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And this is the kind of mindset that we are to have. We are to be a prayerful people who are living on mission. And regardless of what circumstances of life we find ourselves in, regardless of how favorable the circumstances are politically or in in our country towards Christians, or how harsh and difficult they are, the Apostle Paul exhorts that prayer be made For all people, prayer is to be priority for us. Too many Christians treat prayer as a spare tire. A spare tire is only seen when you're in a crisis, when there's a blowout on the side of the highway, and then all of a sudden you're like, where's that spare tire? You been there? Anybody else been there? Where's that spare tire? And then you're searching, okay, do I have the the thing to, to turn it? Do, you know, is, is this, is it, does it have enough air in it? Should I even be doing this on the side of the road because these cars are flying by real quick? And then we pull out that spare tire when we find ourselves in trouble. And yet this is supposed to be the very, the, the, just the, the second nature for us. It's supposed to be a habit for us. And so Paul puts this first as, as a priority in his exhortation to Pastor Timothy. Because life is hard. And there's, we are in a spiritual battle. There are, there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness that we are battling against. And if we think we can just reason our way through and just speak our way through life and just use our giftedness to make something happen for the glory of God, we will find ourselves greatly disappointed and humiliated. It, the better way is to humble ourselves to humble ourselves before God in prayer and acknowledge our need for him. So Paul exhorts Timothy, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made. He uses four different words describing prayer. Supplications, which is just simply petition, and prayers Prayers is just a general uh, word for prayers. Intercession is the idea of praying on behalf of another. And I think we all know what thanksgiving is, right? We give thanks to the one who gives us every good and perfect gift that we experience in this life, and he is worthy of it. God forbid that we should go through life and experience all the goodness that we get every single day. Morning, new morning mercies. We get family. We get food. We get beautiful sunrise and sunset. God forbid that we should go through life and not pause and daily take time to say, God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for life. And thank you for the people you've placed in my life. Thank you even for the leaders, the the political leaders, the governors the president, the vice president, whether you agree with them or not. Thank you for them. We're to pray for them. And so Paul uses four different words here describing prayer. And and what is repeated in this section of Scripture is this idea of prayer being made for all. God's heart for all peoples. All peoples. And so he calls us to be a prayerful people. He calls us to pray for our leaders. Oftentimes in prayer meetings, this is a verse that I love to pull out to remind myself and remind those I'm leading in prayer that we are to target those who carry authority in the land for the advance of the gospel. We are to pray for those who make decisions, who have authority to make decisions in our nation and in the nation's that would, that would either give um, support to or freedom for the spread of the gospel or that would be a hindrance to Christians spreading the gospel and living a peaceful and godly and a quiet life. So we're to pray for them even if we don't like them, even if we disagree with them. And I'm not talking about just those psalms that talk about God get them, God get them. 
right? The, the, there's psalms that, that many of us don't know what to do with in the book of Psalms. But, but we're told by Jesus to even pray for those who spitefully use us. To bless those who curse us. To do good to those who harm us. And Jesus modeled this when he went to the cross. When he himself was being persecuted and killed and and nailed to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so this idea of praying for our leaders has underneath it the biblical conviction that God is the highest authority. That God is the highest king and the highest ruler, and he is sovereign over all, regardless who's in the White House, or regardless of who is calling the shots in whatever country that seems so dark and so difficult for Christians to live in. We pray to a sovereign God. Prayer is the language of those who believe that their God is sovereign and he can do something about the brokenness in this world and he's chosen to do so through the prayers of his people. This is God's will for us. This is pleasing the God. This is what God wants for each one of us. To be prayerful. I mean, how many of us just tolerate this nagging anxiety anxiety in our lives and fear, crippling fear in our lives because we're not bringing it to God adequately in prayer and rolling the burden off to him in prayer? He says, be anxious about nothing but, but all things by prayer and supplication, letting your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have a tendency to want to keep up with what's going on in the world, and I read the news. And I read things, I read headlines, and I feel something inside happen when I read certain headlines. And I could just let that feeling that's rising up of anxiety, like, oh no, the world's coming to an end. What are we going to do? Nuclear war, or whatever it is, whatever the next headline is. And I have to consistently remind myself in a fallen, broken world that there is a God who is sovereign, who is in charge, and he holds it all together. And he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we pray to him. We pray to him because we believe, as Proverbs 21 says, that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and he turns it whichever way he wishes. He turns hearts. Here's, this is also consistent with Paul's instruction and Peter's instruction to the Roman Christians, Paul to the Romans, and Peter uh, in his first letter there. And and this is consistent with the posture that we as Christians should have towards authority because ultimately God is the highest authority and God establishes authority, even the ones that we don't like, even the ones that aren't seemingly to be doing God's will. Romans 13, 1 and 2 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Let that sink in. That, that should give us some confidence. That should free us up to not be afraid of those evil tyrant kind of leaders when we know that ultimately God is in charge and he allowed these guys to do what they're doing. Therefore, whoever resists authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Peter says very, something very similar. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. You see, we as Christians believe that government has a God-given purpose in this world. And part of that God-given purpose is to protect life, to preserve life and to resist and and to suppress those who are doing evil or suppress evil, to hold down those who have evil agendas to take life. Aren't you thankful that you can call 911 if there's something going down right here or in your home and authorities will come to resist the evil that is happening? Are you thankful for that in our country? Not every country gets that luxury. 
Not every country has that privilege where there are authorities who do respond. Now, and of course, they're not perfect. We know they're not perfect. But we should acknowledge their God-given place and their limitations. They have their limitations, right? God, God uses the means. So this is the posture that we should have towards leaders, even the leaders that we don't like. And so we're to pray for them and we're to believe. If you don't like them and you really don't like what they're saying, what they're doing, and you're really concerned about the world, don't just criticize them. Don't just freak out. Pray. Pray that God would change their hearts because God does this. God does this. And this, this by the way, he says is, it's pleasing to God. God is actually happy when his people live godly lives and they aim to live a quiet, godly life that honors him and they pray for their leaders. Now, by the way, you know who was in power when Paul was writing this? Nero. If you've read anything about history, you know that Nero was far out there and not the kind of guy you would vote to be in the White House, okay? And Paul says, pray for these guys. Pray for them for the sake of the gospel to continue to flourish, for the sake of people to come to faith. As we talked about last week, we must not forget that just back in chapter 1, the Apostle Paul was sharing his own testimony, and he was using his authority as a religious leader to persecute this sect called the Way. He, he was persecuting Christianity because he considered it to be false, a false way. And so he thought he was doing service to the one true God by having these Christians thrown in the prison and having them killed. I wonder how many people were praying for Saul of Tarsus. This guy who was breathing threats upon the church. This guy who was intimidating the people of God and having them thrown into prison, having them killed. I wonder how many mamas, how many children, how many fathers were praying because their loved one was getting taken away because of him. They prayed, and they prayed, and he was there when Stephen had that powerful speech in Acts chapter 7. And they stoned him, and Stephen is there looking up, and he sees Jesus, and, and he's just shining bright. Surely that had to have some kind of effect on Saul of Tarsus. We know in chapter 9, Jesus confronts him in his ignorance and his blindness, and he rescues him. As I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a, two years ago, I was running errands with my little son, uh, my youngest son, Justice. He was three years old at the time, and I was, one of the errands, errands I was running was to go get a key made for the church, so, uh, and, and so I was having a conversation with him, and I overheard him say, I will kill the bad guys. I will shoot them with my gun. And so I'm like, okay, well, I need to respond to this. I can't just say, amen, yeah, kill them with the gun. We're in Texas. Pull them out, right? No way. That's not what I said. You know what I said? I said, what if, what if we turn the bad guys into good guys by praying for them? He thought for a moment. With, with the theological depth that he has, he said, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't turn them into good guys. They're bad guys. And I said, well, why not? He said, only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can do that. I said, yeah, that's why we pray to Jesus so that he will change the bad guys and turn them into good guys. Right? And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Justice, for that opportunity. It was a deep theological conversation, and he was right. He was right that we can't change bad guys. We don't have the power to change anybody's heart, but God does. God can do that miracle in the worst of sinners, the hardest of hearts. And so we pray to the God who rescues the worst of sinners like Saul of Tarsus and turns them into some of the greatest missionaries to herald the good news of the gospel. 
And so Paul tells us we should pray for all people, all people. Okay, this is repeated. It's, this is clear that God's global purposes and vision and plan for all peoples, every tribe, every tongue. People are going to get saved, and you need to pray like that, that he, God is going to rescue people from every tribe and every tongue. We need to believe that. We need to believe his heart for people to save people. Is there anybody that you are reluctant to put on your prayer list because you're like, I'm not praying for that person. I know that person. I, do, I don't want to pray for that person. You might need to pray for them even more. Those people are, are the ones you may need to pray for even more just for the sake of your own heart, forgiving them, releasing them, believing that God's grace is enough to break through their blindedness. We're told in Revelation that this is what's going to happen. This is, this, is, this is a snapshot of heaven. Okay, this is, this is uh, it says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seal for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language, and people, and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We have a vision for this here at City Church. We want to know Jesus, love people, and impact your world because that we believe that's the heartbeat of God. We believe that he wants the, the gospel to be proclaimed throughout the entire world so that people from every tribe and every tongue and every language would hear it and believe it and experience eternal salvation through the prayers of his people and through the proclamation of the gospel. And when we read the book of Acts, this is what we see God doing through the church. They prayed and they proclaimed. They prayed and they proclaimed. They prayed and they proclaimed. And the kingdom of God was spreading. God's will was being done on earth. And the kingdom was spreading. Lives were being transformed. Here at City Church, faithful prayer is a value that we have. We value faithful prayer. Jesus taught that we should, men should always pray and not lose heart. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5 that this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, that you pray without ceasing. Paul exhorts prayer because it's God's will. Jesus exhorted prayer because it's God's will. Jesus modeled it for us. Paul modeled it for us. The early church modeled it for us. And we want to be those who embrace this not as a, merely as an aspirational value, but, but as an actual value in our lives. Because we believe God is sovereign, and we believe he is good, and he uses the means of our prayers to bring about his good plans in the world. And we all have access. We all have equal access to the Almighty. To go before the throne of grace because of the blood of Jesus. We have access to the wisest person in the universe. The most loving person and patient person in the universe. We have access to the wealthiest person in the universe who has all the resources, unlimited resources. We have access to the most powerful person in the universe. It would be foolish for us not to use this great privilege we call prayer. Now we also see Paul exhorted, this is the main thrust of this passage, is pray, pray, pray. But along with it is this idea of being peaceful and godly. Be a peaceful and a godly church. He gives a, a focus of these prayers, or, or, or a goal or an aim of these prayers, so that we might lead a peaceful and a quiet Life, godly and dignified in every way. Christians are called to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. Right? We're called to be peacemakers, not troublemakers. Just like in, 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 in Jeremiah 29, in Jeremiah 29, 7, um, through, the, through Jeremiah, he was, he was, uh, his message was a, a, opposed to the false prophets who were prophesying in the day because the people were in exile. And he was saying, seek the welfare of the city, for in its welfare you will find your own welfare, your own peace. Seek the peace of the city, the shalom of the city. Seek that. 
Like, Christians should be good citizens who honor God-given authority, even if that authority isn't, isn't serving God, right? Because we believe God is sovereign. He establishes authority. And we should be those who contribute to the good of those around us, not troublemakers. This is a part of our witness. When we live lives of godly good conduct that adorns the good news that we're proclaiming. When the, when the outside watching world does not see good godly conduct, as Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see what? Your good works that they may glorify your Father in heaven. When they don't see the two together, they perceive hypocrisy. And perhaps it is many times. Perhaps, it, perhaps if we're just preaching and we're just praising and we're just talking about God and we're just listeners of the word and we're not doers, we are deceiving ourselves. And we're not helping others to faith. We're hindering. And so Paul says, you know, be prayerful for these leaders. Be a prayerful church. Pray with supplications, with thanksgiving, with intercessions so that we can lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. You see, not every country has, has the, the privilege of meeting peacefully like this here today. I mean, if you were, if you were in North Korea right now, just saying that's one of the harshest places to, to be a Christian. If you were in North Korea right now, this would be a very dangerous meeting to be happening right here, talking about Jesus. It'd be very dangerous, Right? And so Christians are to pray for their leaders so that what we're able to experience here today, so we can experience the goodness of what we're experiencing here today, gathering together as the people of God, living a peaceful and quiet life. And we see this concept also in verse 8 where, where Paul instructs men, and he goes and he instructs men and women here, but in verse 8 he instructs men, uh, he says, I desire that in every place men should pray, lifting up holy hands without doubt, or without anger, and without quarreling. Okay? So Paul says to the men, and, and, and why, why does he say this? I, I think he says this because this is our tendency as men. Many men tend to quarrel and debate, Right? And, and, and anger in our, in, in our flesh, our tendency is to, to get angry and, and, and to not be kind and not be gentle and not be patient and just maybe talk theology and talk God. And then and that, that affects our, our lack of godly conduct. That affects our prayers. That definitely affects if, if, if in our relationship with our wives, husbands, if you don't dwell with your wife in an understanding way. 1 Peter 3, 7 says that your prayers can be hindered. Like if you're if you're you're not considerate of your wife and you don't you're not you don't have a gentle godly life, then it's going to affect prayer and it's going to affect the corporate worship. If you're quarrelsome out there, you're quarrelsome in your home and you're quarrelsome with people out there, and you come into corporate worship, that that tension, that contention, is just going to spread into the church, right? And this was characteristic of false teachers. This was characteristic of false teachers. They were quarrelsome. They were divisive. And Paul says, a ser chapter, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be able, he must be gentle to all, able to de teach, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God would grant them repentance. And so the godly life that God calls us to live as a church is, is to a prayerful life, and it's a peaceful life. We are to pursue peace with all people. Now, and I'm not, I want to make it clear, too, I'm not talking about peacekeeping, never rocking the boat. Because Jesus is our example here. He was a peacemaker, wouldn't you say? But there were times where, where, you might, where one might have judged him, and Paul as well, as a troublemaker because of the response of the people. There was a stirring up. There was a rejection. There was tension because of the truth that he was not willing to compromise. And so leading a peaceful and quiet life, a godly life dignified in every way, let me just say this. Men, this is not passivity. This is not passivity. This is not living a mediocre life where you're just, you know, I'm not going to mess with them. I'm not going to speak any difficult truth that might stir something up. Because we're called to speak the truth in love. 
right? We're called to say hard things. But how do we do it? Do we do it with love? Do we do it with humility? Do, do, we, do we time it right? Okay, uh, husbands, you know, there's, there's a certain time uh, when you need to bring something up to your spouse. There's a certain time not to do that. And, you, and many of us have had to learn the hard way, right? You know, timing matters in a courageous conversation, all right? And so, <clears throat> so anyways, so we are called to be a prayerful and a peaceful church. We're also called to be a gospel-centered church. And the gospel, by the way, is going to cause offenses. People are going to stumble at the truth of the gospel, and we don't want to get in the way of that. We want to be good witnesses, godly witnesses, who live lives that are consistent with the good news, that adorn the good news, and we want to speak it in a way that's honoring to God and, and helpful to others. Look, let's look at what Paul says here. And, and as a theological basis for what he just said about praying for everybody, right, and li li living a godly life, he says this, he says, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So, so check it out. He's, first of all, highlighting there's one God. It's, it's not polytheism. It's, it's not, there's many. There's one true God. And he said, there's one mediator between God and men. Now, this is controversial in our, in our pluralistic culture that would argue, well, there's many ways to God. You, who are you to say this way isn't, isn't a, 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 a acceptable? an acceptable way or a good way to follow God. Well, the problem with, with that is what Jesus said. The problem is that our Lord said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. The problem, as we see here with, with many in our culture, is, is what, what Paul's saying, that there's one mediator between God and men. There's only one way. There's not many ways to salvation. There's not many ways to, to get to know God. It's through Jesus Christ. And when you know him, you're going to know the Father. And notice that Jesus, or that Paul says about Jesus that he gave himself as a ransom for all. He gave himself as a ransom for all for all. This is gospel. This is good news. All right? Who Jesus is and what he came to do by giving his life as a ransom for all, Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That's what he said in Mark 10, 45. And so Jesus and Paul are both telling us here with this word ransom and Jesus giving him li his life, they're both indicating that the life of Jesus that was given to die in our place bore the wrath of God, took our place, and bought us back, redeemed us, bought us by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's no other way to experience eternal salvation. It's through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. This is very offensive. In the early 2000s, this bumper sticker came out. If you all have seen this, coexists. And I've talked to many people over the years who have brought this statement up. This idea of coexist. You know, there's, there's all these different religions and, you know, we, we have to coexist. Okay? Now, first of all, I would say we, we are told as Christians we are to pursue peace with all people. We just looked at that. We are to be a peaceful people, right? We're not to try to, to, to um, ex exert force on people to advance our mission, Okay? We're, we're not. Jesus didn't. It's not how we spread the good news. It's not how the kingdom of God spreads. We don't take up swords and guns to spread the kingdom. Otherwise, Jesus would have did it. Right? Jesus told um, 
He, he said in John 18, if my, my, if my kingdom was of this world, he told Pilate, my servants would fight. Which is just how it is, right? And, and so, <clears throat> so this idea of coexist, now it, 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 does, it def, definitely communicates one thing, that we, we should be able to get along. And the reality is, is that the world doesn't. I mean, you look over the Middle East, and there's just constant fighting. Or, or maybe you've, you've experienced it in your own family where there's different religions. There's constant fighting. I think, first of all, as Christians, we should be winsome. We should be wise. We should be loving. We should be gracious and compassionate. But we are not to compromise the truth of Scripture. You see, the, Jesus said he's the only way. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father God except through him. There's not, there's not many ways. And I'm reminded of this conversation that I had at Thanksgiving dinner and with, with a guest that was at, at family dinner. And, and we were talking about this. And this was a lady who, who had embraced a, a whole bunch of different religious ideas. And she kind of pieced it together to be her religion. And, and she challenged me. And, 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 and as it, she challenged me with Christianity being narrow. It's, it's, it's narrow. You can't say that this way is not right or this, that, that way is not right. And so I had to admit, humbly admit, you know what? There's, there's an element of exclusivity. Christ says he's the way. He, he says it in John 14, 6. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through, through me. I'm not ashamed of that. You and I should not be ashamed of this, okay? We might be seen as haters, narrow-minded. We, we might be seen as uh, just religious and stuffy because we believe this. We believe this because our Lord said this. Our Lord said this. He said in, in Matthew eleven twenty seven. he said, All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. No one knows the Father except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Man, there's a sovereignty there that we just got to, as Christians, accept, right? Jesus, in, in, in an exclusivity, that, that Jesus is the only way, and it's only through him, it's through his work and his person. He's the only mediator between God and man. He became a man to die in our place, to be the ransom for our sin, to take our sin away. Now, yet, also, now we, we must hold this truth tightly and not compromise. This is an essential, Okay? Now, we must also hold this idea of, as, as Paul's arguing in this passage, is that we are to universally proclaim the good news. We are to tell, we are to pray for all people, or all, all peoples, right? We're to, we're to proclaim the gospel to, to everyone, to live a missional life. That's my next point here. Be a missional church. And this is an implication in the text. It's not explicit, but it's the theological framework. The theological, it's what this, this call to pray for all is rooted in, and, and it's also a, a theological basis for us being a missional church. And for Paul, being an apostle, doing what he was doing, going not only to Jewish people, but to Gentiles. You see, many, even Jewish Christians struggled with this. Even Peter wrestled with this. You read the book of Acts. Bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jews, right? So, so the, theologians point out here that what, what Paul is responding to with these false teachers that he's addressing is this idea of, of exclusivism, this idea of just their group only. Um. And, and so, yes, there's an exclusivity in, in, in Jesus being the only way, but the gospel is for everyone. Everyone. We don't know who's going to respond to it or not. We don't know who the elect are, who God has chosen. Because the Bible does say that he's chosen people. He's chosen, if you're a Christian, he chose you, right? So how do we reconcile Paul's teaching and even Jesus' teaching in the gospel of John with this? Paul says in verse 4 that God desires all people to be saved and come 
to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? If you can't accept that verse as theological truth, if there's resistance in you, I, I invite you to explore why. Why? Maybe, maybe you need to wrestle a little bit with this and some other passages and see how do these fit together because they do fit together, right? Paul's not contradicting himself. He's not contradicting Jesus when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him and he, but he will not perish but have everlasting life. God desires all people to be saved. Now, here's one of the things that I find helpful as I've wrestled through this. God desires this. Has God decreed that all people are going to be saved? Has God said all people are going to be saved? We call this universalism. Okay? The idea that everybody's going to heaven. It did, so, in other words, it doesn't really matter which way you, you, you end up getting there. We're all going there when we die. Okay? That's, that's a lie. Right? And it's called universalism. And yeah, that may feel better to accept it, and people may like it in a pluralistic culture, but it's just not true. And so we, we have this missional thrust because that's not true. Not everybody is going to be saved, but God wants people to be saved. He desires all people to be saved. The, theologians wrestle with this, and I must, I must admit that there's some mystery here between divine sovereignty and human responsibility, and the Bible teaches both, and so we embrace both, and we can take this at face value that God wants people to be saved, and our job is not to try to figure out who the elect are and share the gospel with just them. As one theologian says, they don't have like a yellow stripe on their back, right? Um, we're to proclaim the gospel to everybody, and with confidence that some will respond, some will believe. Some will experience eternal life. Some will come to the knowledge of the truth and be delivered out of the deception that they've bought into. That they're good enough. Or that there's other ways. Paul in verse 7, he says, For this I was, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, and I'm telling you the truth, not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and in truth. Paul believed this so much that he was willing to give his life for it. He was willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel. Here we go. Is that my sign to, to wrap it up? Let me close with a couple points of application. There's much more that could be said and should be said about this. But let me, let me just highlight two points here. One, resolve to make space in your life for prayer. Resolve to make space in your life for prayer. This should be a daily thing for us. We need God. And prayer is the language of the humble, the dependent, those who are leaning on God for help leaning on God to advance the mission, leaning on God to save those wayward loved ones. We pray, we pray, and we proclaim the good news, believing that God will save. Here we, we have Wednesday night, 6 o'clock. If you want to pray with other believers, you can come here and pray, and we're going to pray for more than just us and more than just our church, we're going to expand our prayers to globally and pray God's kingdom come, God's will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. But there are things that arise that are pressing in our own hearts that we need to talk to God about. We could just carry that weight around with us and feel that, 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 under, uh, um, that, that, that nagging of, of anxiety or burden or we can adequ adequately bring those things to God in prayer, roll those things off to God, ask God's help, ask God's wisdom, ask God's direction, ask that God would glorify his name in various situations. 
There's a, there's a book, if you need help expanding your prayers beyond yourself, beyond your church, beyond your city, or your country even, there's a book called World Operation. And World Operation uh, goes through uh, every, every nation in the world in, in a year, and it assigns each day of the year, it assigns a people group to pray for, and it gives a little overview of that people group and some of, some of the challenges and some of the demographics, the religious, the spiritual state in the world. And you might learn, some, learn about some countries you've never even heard of, right? And, and this, is, this is a great thing to implement with your family or even personally and, and, and pray in view of God's global vision to save people from every tribe and every tongue. And so this will help, I believe, uh, cultivate a passion for global and local missions, knowing God's global plan and the necessity of the gospel to bring salvation to sinners. Um, pray for us for the mission trip that we have coming up um, this, this summer, and, and we're looking to build a team here. Uh, we, have a, we have a handful of people who said they are interested in going. If you want to be a part of a short-term mission trip that's, that's, not, that's within the state, it's on the border of, of uh, Texas and Mexico, uh, come join us this summer and be a part of the team and, and experience a bit of God's heart to reach people outside of the DFW area. And so we want, to be, we want to participate in that. Here at City Church, we support uh, a church plant in Taiwan and, and, and Italy and, and, and others in, within the states. And, and we send 10% of our income to other church plants because we want to participate in what God is doing on a, on beyond just here at City Church and beyond just here in the DFW area. In a couple of weeks, we're going to have a message. Jacob is, is planning to preach a message on, on the Great Commission and, and, and help move us in that direction. Let us be a people who are prayerful. Let us be a people who are on mission for him. Amen? If y'all would pray with me.